Kalamazoo River, take my mind. And don't let her memory torture me. And welcome back to uh, the Star Dressing Room at the Sands Hotel and Casino. Backstage of the Cobra Room, Willie Nelson. Welcome back to Atlantic doing? City. Thank you. And congratulations, because I understand that the paycheck you learned this week is going to go to you and not to the IRS. How about that? Hey, That's way to go. go. Yeah. Finally got square with them. Yes, sir. Must be a good feeling. Oh, yeah, after 14 years. Was it that long? Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. It's, yeah, 14 short years. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's your money. Not, yeah, not the, at least thought, this week. <laughs> this week, anyway. Listen, I mentioned at the top, the, the top of the show we'd talk about Farm Aid. Before we do, something related, I guess, to Farm Aid. You were in the news just recently regarding a, a situation with a pig farmer in Texarkana or something? No, he was in Nebraska. In Nebraska, okay. okay. And, and, well, That's a was, strange story. Uh, the guy was a very good farmer, pig farmer there in Nebraska, and he had about a million dollar operation, and he didn't know, I think he, he had around, uh, he owed 200 some thousand dollars, so he had a, quite a bit of equity in his farm and everything, so, so he went to a different bank, his old bank went out of business, so he went to a new bank, and they didn't, wouldn't loan him enough money to do what he needed to do, so when his first payment came due, they come in and foreclosed on him. So he's 70 something years old, and uh, in the meantime, his wife and all this has happened. She dies right in the middle of the whole thing. She can't handle it. And he goes to prison. And uh, the reason he goes to prison is because his hogs, he has some hogs that now belong to the bank, right? But they're still out in the barn. And, uh, he's, and he's allowed to stay on this piece of property as a sharecropper or whatever and pay rent. And, but he doesn't have any money to eat. They're eating popcorn and the hogs are starving to death. So he borrows some money on some of the hogs, sells some of the hogs mm -hmm. to feed the rest of the hogs. And they sent him to prison. He's serving time right now in Livingsworth. He sent him to prison just for, for what, missing a the payment? They sent him to prison for, for selling those for selling hogs. Oh, okay. Because they weren't... Because they were mortgaged they were, hogs. And, uh, and they sent him to prison. Yeah, he's there now. Right, now, you got, now how, you, how did you get involved? Because you got involved... I call him the Attorney General, Janet Reno? Well, actually, I got involved because his wife, before she died, started calling Farm Aid for some help. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lady there who worked for Farm Aid was calling me and telling me about the story. And, and uh, there was some press and everything on it, so I got uh, copies of what was happening. I was trying to keep up with it along the way. But now, uh, he's in there. I tried to talk with the uh, Attorney General's office tried to, and did talk with the president about it. And uh, so far, he's still in there. Hmm. How, how can you get him out? I mean, he would take a presidential to... pardon because it's a federal law that he broke by selling mortgaged property. And I think he oh. sold it in his sister's name and tried to hide it so he wouldn't get caught. And that worked against him. You know? And this is a man who's in his 70s, been his doing 70s. this all his life. Yeah, in his 70s. Now his son is left there in the house that they used to own. And now he's. They're letting him live there nicely. How can you talk about this so, you know, calmly? I mean, obviously, you're, you're mad about this. Well, yeah, I sure am. And it's a, it's a terrible story, but there are thousands more like it out there that other farmers are going through. And uh, this one just so happened to caught the attention of the news media, mm -hmm. and uh, or else no one would have known about it. Uh, have you seen the change in the Clinton administration's policy toward the American farmer? One of the main things that the farmers were telling me all through these years that they needed was to raise the loan rates. Uh, Mike Espy and the Agricultural Department did that. They, uh, last year, they gave us a 10% loan, loan rate increase, which, uh, I'm sorry to say, was eaten up by the price of living. So uh, uh, the 10% that they gave them uh, didn't mean anything. Uh, it was... It was a nice first step, mm -hmm. but it, there needs to be many more steps to follow it up to really help the farmer. And so there, so the, there have been steps, but baby steps. Baby steps, because the problem is getting worse every day. We're still losing 500 small family farmers every week. Every week? Every week. Well, and that's the bread and butter of, of, the, right. of, the, of the country. That's right. Pretty soon all our food will be 
uh, grown and processed by large corporations. Uh, and you say, what's wrong with that? And the, what's wrong with decide. it is you, first of all, yeah, first right. of all, your, the, your land is going to hell because uh, by the time they use up this acre of ground with all the chemicals and pesticides, they go to the next acre and they go to the next farm over in the next state. And every civilization that's gone out of, that's gone under in the past, if you'll check history, they've gone under because of the inability to feed their people, soil erosion. And the state of Iowa, before the floods and all the natural disasters that came last couple of years, the state of Iowa in the last hundred years had already lost 50% of their topsoil. So, so that's Iowa. I'm sure the other states fall along somewhere in, the, in that neighborhood. So we're losing all the topsoil. How much did we lose? It went down the Mississippi River, you know, uh, at the, when we had the floods. Right. A lot of it, a whole lot of it. Now you have a farm. I, I have a farm, right. yeah. Uh, is it an active farm or is it a I have farm? I have a, a, a ranch, really, and I have some horses, and, and I really don't try to uh, uh, do anything. I have them around for pleasure. Mm -hmm. I don't try to make a living off the farm or the ranch. Why well, you see too many go under, I guess, right? Yeah, I, I, I used to uh, raise hogs one time. I, I took off from the road, and I was living in Ridgetop, Tennessee, and I raised hogs for a year. Almost went broke. <laughs> 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 I bought them for, I bought hogs for, 25 cents a pound at wiener's size, and then five months later when I had to sell them, I only got 17 cents a pound, and I'd fed them all this period of time. So I know what the farmers go through, and I know why they lose money every year. And was that the, uh, the impetus for Farm Aid? What, what brought Farm Aid together? No, what really gave me the idea was Live Aid. Uh, Live Aid, I was watching it one day from somewhere in a hotel and I uh, saw Bob Dylan and he was saying, wouldn't it be nice if some of this money stayed here in this country for our small family farmers? So I started checking out to see if there was a problem and sure enough, there was. Hmm. And so you rounded up a few friends and... And we had our first farm aid. 85, 86? Mm -hmm. And we thought maybe one was all that was necessary. Uh, and now we're going into farm aid seven in New Orleans at the Superdome on September 18th. And the farmer is in worse shape now than he was then, because now not only are the prices still too little for him to make a living, but now he has to contend with all the fires, hurricanes, the floods, and the tornadoes, and all these things that won't let him make a living. So you're going to keep on playing the guitar and singing? You're not going. I'm not going into farming. Farm, no. I guarantee you, I'm not. But you'll, you'll keep doing farming. <laughs> no, but there ought to be a way to get those millions of farmers who in the, in the last few years have lost their farm. There ought to be a way to get them back on the land because now whenever five farmers go under, one business in that community goes under. So the next thing that follows are your schools and your hospitals and that whole community becomes a ghost town and everybody moves to the next so it's big a ripple, town it's a ripple effect and it then. causes the problem. And I sincerely believe that the problem with our economy and the problem with the whole thing in this country and we've always heard that the farmer is the backbone of our country. Right. I've heard that all my life. I'm 62 years old and I believe it. Uh, but now we're breaking the backbone. So when the first farmer had to leave the land because him and his wife couldn't make a living off of 200 acres of land, that's when we have started having our problem. And that's when the cities became overcrowded. Uh, everybody moved into the big cities and tried to compete with the jobs in Detroit, New York, Cleveland, and all these places. And there just is not enough room there. I can't help but think back to that you know, the man we were talking about at the top of the show with, with the, the problem with the, with the pig farm. Here's a guy who I'm sure was farming all his life. Oh, yeah. And now he's quite likely, unless something happens, going to die in jail because he couldn't keep his farm because, because of what? Because of a, of, a, of a rule. Because of a banker. A banker. Hmm. Something to think about. Yeah. Let's talk music for for a little bit. Can we can we get sure, yeah. it? From banking to music. From banking <laughs> to music. Well, uh, you you know a little bit about both. I would. Think. I think so. Yeah. Um, when you first went to Nashville, back what, late fifties, early sixties, they loved the songs you wrote, but they weren't crazy about your voice. And yet in Texas, mm -hmm. they kind of embraced the Willie Nelson sound. What was that? I don't know. I guess I have an unusual delivery, or maybe I have, it was more so back then than it is now. And I was not considered commercial, you know, in in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And if you're not considered commercial, then not very much happens to you. 
and uh, because that's the bottom line. Right. If they think you can't sell records, well, they're not going to spend a lot of money on you. But you could write songs, though. I mean, they were well, they were interested in, in the songs you were writing, weren't they? Yeah, they were, and that was the good part. So how did you help turn them around? Because Nashville eventually came to embrace you, didn't they? Well, you know, the song is uh, is the, the secret to the music business. Uh, and they know that and they appreciate the writers more so now than they used to. And uh, So now a lot of companies hire uh, writers and give them recording contracts just to get their songs for their other artists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what they did with me in the beginning, is they wanted my songs for their other artists. And that's fine, too. You know. Yeah, nothing well. Uh, nothing wrong with it. No, I mean, Crazy did very well for Patsy Cline. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whiskey River, don't run dry. You're all I got to get me. Was a bridge washed out at the bottom of the hill and the big creeks up and the little creeks level. Plow my corn with a double shovel, you gotta stay all night. Stay a little longer, dance all night. Dance a little longer. Well, I'll grab your partner and pat her on the head if she don't like biscuits and feed her cornbread. The gals around Big Creek about half wrong. Jump on a man like a dog on a ball, you gotta stay all night. Stay a little longer, dance all night. A little longer, pull off your coat and throw it in the corner. Don't see why. Don't stay a little longer, so stay all night. Stay a little longer, dance all night. Dance a little longer, pull off your coat and throw it in the corner. Don't see why. Stay a little longer, so stay all night. Stay a little longer, dance all night. Dance a little longer, pull off your coat and throw it in the corner. Don't see why. Don't stay a little longer, so stay all night. Stay a little longer, dance all night. I was looking at the uh, at the CD of your last LP, and I noticed that there's songs on there written by Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. Peter Gabriel. Uh, keep, keep filling in the blanks here for me. Did these people come to you with these songs, or did you find them and say, I want to I take a crack at that? I have to give all the credit to Don Waz, the producer. Uh, he knew all these people. Uh, he knew Bob Dylan, he knew uh, John Hyatt, he knew... Uh, Bonnie Raitt, and I knew a lot of these people too, but he right. knew them well enough to call them up on the telephone and say, hey, let's make a record. And he put it all together. Those songs, the, the Bob Dylan song, he and I wrote one together, uh, Heartland, but then there's one that he wrote, Oh, What Was It You Wanted? Uh, I would have never picked that song for myself, even though now that I've recorded it and listened to it, I said, well, yeah, I guess that sounds okay. But I would have never picked that one for me. The Sinead O'Connor song that mm -hmm. we did, uh, Don't Give Up, the Peter Gabriel's, uh Peter, yeah, Peter, Peter Gabriel. Gabriel right. Come to find out, uh, Sinead and Peter Gabriel were old friends. She knew the song. We went to the studio. And she did it in ten minutes. It was easy. Wow, it's an it's an eclectic group of people that you've worked with over the years. I mean, from Julio Iglesias to Sinead O'Connor, it's mm -hmm. far apart. You enjoy that, don't you? I sure do. Yeah, I think it takes us all. Really, who would you like to work with that you haven't recorded with? Well, I don't know. I just did a song with Frank Sinatra. I, that all right, that's great. what I was hoping you were going to say. Yeah. You did one yeah, for I, duets, too. For his next duet album. Which song? Well, I did um, My Way. Uh, he and I did that one together. But now they're asking me to do another one. They want me to do uh, Mac the Knife. So that'll be fun, too. With with Frank's with custom Frank, lyrics yeah. and, and everything? Yeah. Now, I'll, did you record with him, or was this one of these deals where you did your part in, in one part of the world and he did his something yeah, else? Yeah, yeah. 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 So you kind of phoned them in. Kind of, yeah. I, I went to the studio. I have a studio in Austin. I went there and did my part. And, and I suppose he did his earlier in California. You were always one of the original outlaws of country music. And that, they, they hung that title on you, you and Waylon and, and Chris and, and uh, the rest of the boys. And now there's a new breed of country artists that's coming around. The in-laws. The in-laws. <laughs> All right. That's what I wanted to get... <laughs> Are, you know, can there ever be another brand of country music outlaws uh, on the order of what you and and, and Waylon and the guys do? Well, there's some there's some of those guys, those young guys that I consider their own brand of outlaws, kind of like Lyle Lovett and mm -hmm. uh, a whole lot of Marty Stewart and 
A lot of those guys have done things pretty much <clears throat> their own way through the years, and to me, that's what that term right. reflects. In other words, not 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 playing by the rules, going out and making up the rules as you go along. Yeah, playing playing it by ear. Are you happy with what's happened with country music? I mean, I've heard I heard some. In fact, it was um, uh, an agent, an A&R guy, referred to country music as the M O R, the middle of the road music of the '90s. Uh, you happy with that uh, that definition? Oh, I, that sounds okay to me. <laughs> I don't care what they call it. Uh, I don't know this guy, but if that's what it, country mm -hmm. music means to him, that's wonderful. Uh, last year or five years ago, he might not have wrote about it at all. So I'm just glad to see it getting some press and people giving it some recognition. It, obviously, there have been different... Um, almost bastardizations of country music over the past few years. It used to be, I guess, 30 or so years ago, there was basically one form of country music, wasn't there? And now it has, like, well, if you look at it, If you break it up as the way it originally was and really still is, in my mind, there's bluegrass country, right. there's western swing country, there's cowboy classic type country, your Gene Orchard, your Roy Rogers, and you got your George Jones and Hank Williams, that's another kind of country. There's several different kinds of country music. There's the gospel, uh, country acts and artists. Well, and you just did a gospel album, didn't you? Mm -hmm. uh, gospel is in your background because I think about your grandparents were mm -hmm. the gospel were, singers. Right, right. Hmm. Yeah. And that's a form, another form of, of country sure, music? Yeah, sure. Uh, or another form of the blues. I mean, but Johnny really Gimble said there's only two kinds of music, the Star Spangled Banner and the blues. So <laughs> I can't argue with that. No, I guess not. Hey, Willie, again, thanks so much for spending time with us. You're welcome. It. She loves him in spite of his ways that she don't understand. And through teardrops and laughter, they're going to pass through this world and hand. This good hearted woman in love with the good time and She's a good hearted woman in love with the good time and And she loves him in spite of his ways that she don't understand.